Sorry, no five. Thank you. And um, I'm yeah, no, 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 no. That's always you remember it. You're so much better than I am. Um, and it grew it to two and a half billion from 1995 to 2019 when I uh, closed up shop. And uh, since then, I have been doing business consulting and financial coaching, investment coaching, and really trying to get, trying to help women, because I spent like decades really analyzing financials. And I was a comparative literature major in college, and our financials tell us a story. And when we stop thinking of them as these really super judgy numbers telling us all sorts of horrible things about our character and our businesses, and much more like with curiosity about what, what's going on with them, uh, we can make business and money decisions from a really grounded place. And uh, we can feel, we can have our own backs and feel comfortable that we're making decisions, financial decisions, but in integrity and congruent with our own internal values too. So the hierarchy of a dollar, which is very mysterious, and I have not been able to come up with a better way to explain it, uh, is really just is a way to think about money and money decisions. Um, and so it's a useful thing. And I will tell you um, that you will say, this is pretty simplistic. And, and the reason you'll think about that is because you actually know a lot of this intuitively already. Uh, and as I, we go through this, I'll put up like little aphorisms that will remind you that, oh yeah, I already knew this, right? But when we see them and when we can rank order them and when we can trade them off, uh, it just makes it easier when we're approaching a difficult money decision to stop and kind of take it apart and put it back together again. So before I start, I just want to say, um, if you have questions to put them in the chat, Marla will be monitoring the chat. I can't multitask because I'm generationally incapable of it. <laughs> and we'll address questions uh, at the end, unless you know there's something where I've, you know, Marla gives me the big timeout signal and then I'll shut up and then we'll we'll um uh and then I'll address whatever, whatever it is that I have done <laughs> in the moment. Uh, but otherwise, she'll be queuing up the questions for, for the end. I just figure that way we'll have some, some, some good flow and it'll be a little easier on the people watching the recording. All right. So, oh, wait, this is like the really crucial moment. I'm going to share my screen. <laughs> Things can get ugly real fast. But we're going to give it a shot. All right. Okay. So now I'm sharing. All right which means now I can advance the slide. That's an important thing only, however, there we go. So when we have, um, oh, this is interesting. I have this very complicated setup, which I am going to regret in a second. Hang on, I'm gonna stop share and I'm going to use a different place from which to share if you will bear with me. Hang on. Okay, I have all these monitors and um, they're supposed to make my life easier, but that's just a lie. All right, so when we make financial decisions from an emotionally loaded place, right? And sometimes the big ones are very emotionally loaded, right? Um, we, can, we can end up being destabilized because our feelings are taking us all over the place. And we have a hard time really thinking through the financial part. So the kinds of emotions that tend to, to, to be involved in financial decisions are things like fear or desperation or avoidance or insecurity. Like we, we want to feel more secure. We want to have more status. Uh, it can be greed. It can be power. It can be like placation. Like, please, let me throw money at the problem and let it go away, right? Uh, and what that does is it gets in the way uh, the way that, that it affects our financial decisions is that we won't assess the risk properly. We won't assess the, the range of outcomes properly. Uh, we will trust the untrustworthy. Uh, we'll cause ourselves financial harm just to like not have to feel all the feels. Um, and this interaction between emotions and, 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 and money decisions um, really is normal and part of life and being human. And what we need to do is kind of separate out the two. And we can explore the feelings and really try to get as to what we're really feeling and process those. And we can evaluate the financial piece. 
And when we go, when we kind of separate the sort of the, the, the meatball into its two pieces, we can then reintegrate it in a way that may not be the best financial decision on paper, but is the right emotional decision for us. But we're doing that from a really grounded place where we feel really comfortable with what could happen, with the best case, the worst case scenario. Um, and, and we just feel really good that no matter what the outcome is, that we have done our best and it really reflects uh, how we feel in the moment. And that's, uh, that's a way that, that we can feel much more grounded about our decisions. And, okay, because otherwise this is what happens. <laughs> you know, decisions that are made out of fear and desperation and scarcity uh, are really, tend to be like really, really bad ones. So um, it's, let's not be the hungry ghost. This is like a Buddhist hungry ghost where like nothing is ever enough. And no matter how much you feed it, it just, so we want to be able to feel good that we don't have to feed this feeling of not feeling good about the decisions that we make. And this is what this webinar is about today is to really help figure all of that out. So to that point, um, dollars really fall into two buckets. Um, one is objective and one is subjective. And I'll talk about the objective ones first because we tend not to pay attention to the subjective ones. And in fact, they can have a huge impact. But really, at the end of the day, the ranking of two dollars $2 that look identical, but one is better than the other, that ranking is really uh, determined by some form of risk. One dollar is riskier in some way than the other dollar. And basically, we want to have the least risky dollar as possible. When, and here I'm talking about absolute value of just like you put two $20 bills next to each other. Uh, and depending on its origin, one will be riskier than the other, okay? The, um, the first and biggest one to think about is an after-tax dollar is worth more than a pre-tax dollar. And I know that we know this, right? Because a pre-tax dollar, we have to pay taxes on. So it could be worth 10% less, 20% less, 30% less. So I know you're gonna be like, wow, this is not rocket science, Marika. <laughs> why are you telling me this? And I will tell you why. It's because we tend to mix up apples and oranges, pre-tax and after-tax dollars all the time. And that can cloud our judgment and it can cloud how we feel about ourselves. So in this, and here's an example. One perfect way is that we say, oh, all right, my salary is $100,000. Um, and my expenses are $50,000, I should have $50,000 left in the bank at the end of the year, right? Uh, by the way, I do all math examples very simply, right? So um, the, the, the issue though, is that that 100,000 in your salary is a pre-tax number, right? And so you could be at the end of the year going, why do I have, why did my bank account not grow at all? Why, where's the 50,000 I think I should have? And the answer is, it wasn't 50,000. Your pre-tax income was 100,000, and then you're subtracting from it your after-tax expenses. And really your pre-tax income was maybe, your, your after-tax income was really maybe 75,000, um, and depending on what your tax rate is. So for, for those of us who have W-2s, we, we, we tend to know what the amount coming in, because that's an after tax, because the taxes are taken out as we go along. So we tend to have a better sense of looking at oranges to oranges in terms of how far along we should be, right? But those of us who have consulting income or more erratic income, right? And we're not, we don't, we just think, oh, I just got $10,000 in the door. We're not thinking actually, it's more like 7,500, right? So it, this is an important thing in terms of how we think. And whenever we're looking at something, we need to be asking ourselves, is this a pre-tax dollar or an after-tax dollar? So the, the way it matters is in this sort of comparative thing around, you know, our personal profit and loss statement or our business profit and loss statement. The other thing that's an important rule is to always take tax considerations when making a financial decision, right? So when splitting up assets in a divorce, right? It might like, it might be, well, here's 50,000 uh, or you could take this 50,000, but this one's after tax, this one is pre-tax, right? Um, so this one is actually the value is worth more. 
Now, there may be reasons you want, you want to take the pre-tax number, but it's not financially equivalent. The pre-tax number is actually a lower number. The other reason is that um, if we're trying to make a buy versus lease decision, um, we just need to run the numbers, and this is where your tax accountant is really helpful, to see whether uh, what the tax impact would be. So rule of thumb, always think about first, am I looking at apples versus oranges in terms of pre-tax versus after-tax? And when I'm making a decision, right, what are the tax implications? Because a decision might actually look better on an after-tax basis. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. The next big one is liquid versus illiquid. Um, and a liquid, a liquid dollar is one that you can access right away without taking a haircut. So it's cash, it's uh, a money market fund, it's something that you can have access in a pretty short period of time. It doesn't have to be instantly, but you know, really um, quickly. And there are assets that you might have that are that are tied up for nine months, 12 months, and so on. So the, the, the reason that a liquid dollar is worth more, and I think we intuitively know this, right? A liquid dollar is because you, you can have your hands on it 100% of the value instantly, right? And if you, whereas if you put it in a CD and you can't reach it for 12 months without a penalty, you're, you're, you're paying a penalty, there's a transactional cost. Or if you have $10,000, of equity in your house in order to unlock that money, right? Um, you know, your, your, your fur baby just got kidnapped, right? And the ransomers want $10,000. You have that in your house. You can't get the $10,000 out. It's a complicated process to either, you know, to, to put your house up for sale, there are transaction costs. You don't actually know whether you're, what you're gonna get. So liquidity, liquidity is very much valued uh, in the in the sort of hierarchy of dollars. I think I got everything. Did I get everything? Yes. Okay. So yeah, that was the other thing too. I'm looking aside because I, I have I have my notes on the side. Is um, the longer your money is tied up, right? Um, the say your bank you you give ten thousand dollars for a, a twelve month CD. They're going to pay you more than for a nine month CD. Which, and they'll pay you more for that than a three month CD. And the reason for that is that you want to be paid more uh, uh, for for the use of the money for that 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 fact that you can't access it for longer. And they're willing to pay more because they have the certainty that they actually have their hands on that money uh, uh, for for that entire period as well. All right. Now, this is also a really important concept, this idea of a dollar today versus a dollar tomorrow. So we know that a after-tax dollar is worth more than a pre-tax dollar, a liquid dollar is worth more than an illiquid dollar, and a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Um, and the reasons, there are three reasons for this. Um, and um, as a general rule, it's better to borrow today and repay in tomorrow's dollars because of inflation. So inflation eats away at the value of a dollar, right? So in 1980, and I remember 1980, <laughs> uh, in 1980, a movie ticket on average was about, I don't know, $2.89, right? And by 2019, it's about 40 years later, right? A movie ticket was worth $9.16 on average, right? <laughs> So your 1980, $10 in 1980 would only buy you two tickets 40 years later, right? So inflation eats away at the purchasing power so of, uh, of a dollar. So your dollar tomorrow is just literally worth less. Right? But the other reason that a dollar today is worth more, and this is, this is really important for those of you in business and getting money in the door, right? is that time is your friend when it comes to investing, especially. So the longer your money can compound, the longer your money can grow and stay investing, stay invested, uh, the better it can weather the cycles in the market. So the longer it can be, it, it'll grow, it'll compound, and also it'll give you time to kind of go through the different cycles. 
which is why if you are saving up for a down payment on a house, right, and you're going to want to buy that house in a year, you're not going to want to put that in the market because the market could be down 30% in a year, right? So depending on your time, the longer your time horizon, the better off you are. And so time is your friend. So the sooner you put a dollar to work today, the better. So you rather have a money today because it can work an extra than a dollar tomorrow because they'll have that extra day where it's growing and earning in there. The other thing, for those of you who may not know, there's this sort of rule of 72, which is this kind of cute little <laughs> formula that works. Uh, and what you can do is if you want to find out how long it will take for your money to double, um, you divide 72 by the number, uh, by the interest rate that you're getting paid on that money or the expected return if you're going to invest it in the market. And they'll tell you how many years, this is kind of a rough rule of thumb, will tell you how many years it will take you for, to double your money. And you'd be surprised um, at, at how much your money can grow um, when you can just put it somewhere, leave it alone, let it compound, let time do its thing. All right. The third reason is a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow is that it is 100% de-risked. Um, and we know this intuitively because of the saying, you know, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, right? So a dollar today that I have in my hand, I know I have. The dollar that you tell me you're going to give me tomorrow Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Maybe something will happen, right? Um, and so it's it's uh, 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 the de-risking in terms of the credit, right? Are you going to be good for it? Are you going to pay me back? Or also just um, uh, just you know stuff happening, and all of a sudden there are, there is no something happens and there's no dollar to be returned to you. You know we can think of. I don't know, magically aliens land and all dollars disappear uh, electronically or on paper. And then where's that dollar you're owed? It doesn't exist anymore. Okay, I'm just making stuff up. <laughs> but the point is uh, you want your, your dollar today is worth more because inflation will erode its value. The dollar today is worth more because you can put it to work and it can compound for you. And the dollar today is worth more because you actually have it. So it's completely de-risked. Other ways to think about dollars and their hierarchy is an unencumbered dollar is worth more than an encumbered dollar. And by that, I mean the 20 bucks that you own outright is worth more than the 20 bucks that you borrowed, right? Um, and it's because the $20 that you own can earn income, right? You can put it to work. Whereas the $20 that you borrowed, you have to pay rent on it, right? So it's actually costing you money. Uh, and so the idea is that when you borrow money, you're going to invest it and put it to work in something that's going to earn more income right, than it's costing you, which is why it's preferable if you're going to use debt to use it to buy assets that are gonna generate income not assets that are gonna suck up cash. Right? So one kind of notable exception uh, for most of us is those of us who have mortgages, right? Is we borrow a lot of money in order to have a roof over our heads, right? And we have to keep feeding the mortgage and, and feeding real estate taxes and insurance and, and maintenance and all of that sort of stuff. But we'd otherwise be paying rent. Uh, and so there are calculations that you can do rent versus buy. Uh, and I know this is a big subject uh, in Hawaii where we're like, the, the cost of um, housing is so high. Um, but the other thing about using a $20 that's borrowed is that the overall amount that you're borrowing can cause, introduces risk into your own personal or business financial ecosystem, right? Because if you can't pay it back, uh, then, um, uh, then you lose the equity, you lose the ownership that you have, you might have to go bankrupt. Um, there's sort of some bad scenarios about it. I don't want to demonize debt because debt can be a very, very powerful tool and it can be very, very necessary for business, for personal and business growth properly deployed. But in general, you want debt to be uh, deployed against an, an, an asset that 
throws off cash, not one that consumes cash, and an asset that can appreciate in value, not one that depreciates in value. Uh, why? Because you're paying rent on that money. And the other thing is that $20 that's encumbered, I'm not just having to pay rent on it, but the people who lend it to me are going to tell me what to do. And I have seen this as an investor, uh, you know, over more decades than I care to admit, uh, where companies will take on too much debt, there's a downturn, and the bank, they start, their balance sheet starts running their business, right? They start making business decisions based on trying to come up with enough cash to pay the interest expense, or their bankers uh, tell them how to run their business because the bankers want their money back, right? So it's, it's given a choice between $20, and we know this intuitively, I'd rather have the $20 as mine than the $20 I borrow. But sometimes it's important to list all of these things very explicitly so that when we sit down and think through something, we've got a framework, like a Christmas tree that we're hanging these ornaments on. The other dollar that's more valuable than another dollar is the recurring dollar versus the intermittent dollar, right? Because more predictable revenue is less risky. It's viewed as being less risky. Why? Uh, because um, if I'm a banker, I can see that you've got recurring revenue and I would rather lend against someone who, you know, if you have a steady job, I can kind of do all my math and feel really comfortable uh, about your income. If you have boom or bust, you at your boom, you might average out way higher than just the paycheck. But as a banker, I'm worried about those bust periods, right? So, in gen so investors, so not just bankers, but also investors, investors will pay more for businesses that have a steady, recurring, very stable uh, stream of, of revenue and, and profits, right? Um, and so it's just, again, this is a function of risk. I perceive it as being less risky when the way that money comes into your personal or your business ecosystem is steady and predictable. So given a choice between a dollar that I can count on showing up tomorrow and two dollars that may come tomorrow, may come in three days, right? Theoretically, in this conceptual framework, you would go for the dollar that's predictable. So sometimes you just have to like pretend you're a banker and how would they think about it? Which is very different from how entrepreneurs think about risk, but you know, that's a useful little mental exercise to go through. Okay. Um, let's talk about the subjective buckets because a dollar's value changes a lot with context. And this is often a real key to negotiation and people really forget about this because it's so easy to get hung up on the number and on the price. And there's so many other things around the price that can matter way more. So context is the way that we make meaning out of numbers uh, and, and money. And it's something that I talk a lot about to business owners in terms of um, they're getting um, more financially intimate with their businesses is to really look at context, not just look at numbers as these absolute truths, but to really understand the why underneath the numbers, because that's where the wisdom lies. And that's where the source of good decision making comes from, not from the number, but from the reason for that number's existence. All right. Okay. How are we doing so far? Marla, are we good? I'm gonna throw a question at you because it's a good meeting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, at what stage in business should a business owner consider investing capital into CDs, stocks, and bonds or bonds? Uh, I utilized an accountant for my annual taxes. 2023 was my first tax year. You mentioned talking to a, uh, an accountant to determine if business decisions can be financially sound? Do business owners typically check in with their accountant regularly or just contact the accountant when necessary? So I, I think the answer, and I'm so frustrating to everyone because my answer is 90% of the time, it depends, right? Um, so it depends on the size and scale of your business in terms of the frequency with wit and the, and the, the erraticness of your business. Uh, with the frequency with which you would meet with your accountant. So um, if you have a very steady, very predictable and your business is, is growing or you know is at a very predictable rate, 
probably once a year is enough. If your business is, um, I don't know, you, you know, it comes in big chunks, comes in, in, in waves, um, you may want to check in quarterly with your tax account to just make sure that you're setting aside enough and estimated taxes, for instance. Um, in terms of the question around uh, when is it time in a business to invest in other things, it's when you have too much cash, more cash than you need to grow your business, um, and more cash than you then. And again, this is if you if you as a business owner are going to take money out of the business. This is where there's a tax question, right? Are you better off taking it as wages? Are you better off taking it as a distribution? Those are all things to ask your tax accountant. But if you have too much money that you don't know how to deploy, like you don't have more growth opportunities, your business is a cash cow, it's just throwing cash off, then, then you also need to see, do I want to take the money out and invest it myself? Or do I want the, the money to be invested at the business level? And those are all those all involve tax considerations. Did I miss anything? No, that's good. Okay, great. All right, you're in for a treat because this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the subjective value of a dollar. Okay, let's go. I beg your pardon. Man, it was so hot, it's smoking. Hot? Do you mean to imply stolen? He took the bugs for 50 bucks. No, no, no. This is a Roche Foucault, the thinnest water resistant watch in the world. Singularly unique, sculptured in design, handcrafted in Switzerland, and water resistant to three atmospheres. This is the sports watch of the 80s. $6,955 retail. Did a receipt? Oh, it tells time simultaneously in Monte Carlo, Beverly Hills, London, Paris, Rome, and Shah. In Philadelphia, it's worth 50 bucks. Just give me the money. So, um, this is kind of a thing with me. Like, I'm like, okay, but what's it worth today in Philadelphia? Uh, but that's an important lesson in terms of um, value and perceived value and the things that affect perceived value. So when I talk about the subjective hierarchy of money, I'm talking about perceived value. So this is a big one. Um, the sunk cost versus the deployable dollar uh, is, is uh, an example of perceived value, right? And what I mean by sunk cost is that whenever, whatever it is that you have effort that you've put into something, money that you've put into something. So, you know, you started to dig a trench and it cost a thousand dollars. And um, now you're realizing that actually maybe stringing a wire would be better than digging a trench, but you're like, but I already spent a thousand dollars on it, right? That's a sunk cost. And um, it's our, our it, it's our tendency to continue with an endeavor where we've where we've invested money and effort and time, even if the costs outweigh the benefits. And it's because we kind of feel guilty or ashamed uh, that we made the wrong decision, or we're just too like stubborn. <laughs> we don't want to admit that we made a bad decision, right? So we don't want to be like that. The loser, the failure. We made a bad decision. Even if throwing more money, throwing good money after bad, okay, there's another aphorism that I, I didn't write down in my notes, throwing good money after bad, we don't want to throw good money after bad. We just want to accept that that was a mistake, right? Because what can happen with a sunk cost, right? Remember, a sunk cost is money already spent into something, right? By definition, that means that that dollar that got invested in the thing is illiquid, right? So we already know a sunk cost, that dollar, once I put it into something, it's worth less already by definition, right? Even though I'm putting it into something, hoping to create more value from it. So it's a totally legitimate thing to do, but you just have to understand it from a strictly dollar for dollar basis, the liquidity is gone. And I'll give you like a great real life example of that in, in a second. All right. So 
I used to love watching Pimp My Ride. It's this like, it was this reality TV show uh, and this guy, I don't know, exhibit, this rapper exhibit. And they would go and they would take these like real like bus up cars and, and just pimp them up in the most absurd way. Like popcorn makers and videos and like woofers the size of couches. Um, and, and that was the sort of the point of, of it. And, but, and it was amazing to see what they would do with like old ice cream trucks and stuff, right? But the point is like, people do this all the time too, right? So when it comes to like cars, like a lot of guys will do this, right? They'll put a lot of money in the cars, right? And then they go to sell the car and you can see it in the, the, the car classi classified ads, right? You scroll through the, and they're like, you know, I put $40,000 in my, you know, Datsun 280Z, right? So it's worth whatever price they think it's worth, right? Except it's not. It doesn't matter how much money you put into the thing. The value of the thing is what the market clearing price is, what somebody else is willing to pay for it. So you'll see this with houses too. People will be like, oh, look at this. Um, you know, I, I, I did this, I did that. This is, I put in $100,000 in this house. But the house is in is either the footprint or the location, right? The house is not um, uh, potential buyers are not willing to pay a price that reflects that hundred thousand dollars sunk cost in the house because maybe it's the owner's taste and it's really bizarre. Uh, who knows, right? So psychologically, we think, well, but we put money in this thing, and and we get emotionally attached to whatever we sort of either put labor in or put capital in, put money in, and we think it's worth that. And this is separating emotions from the financial piece. The financial piece is what the market is willing to pay. The emotional piece is, I really did such a beautiful job, you know, with all my interior decorations and everything else. And the market goes, yeah, I, I don't want, you know, a hot tub in my in the middle of my sunken living room you know or whatever i have to think of a more absurd example but um it's almost like it's an ego injury for us right but this happens all the time people equate what something is worth with what they've put into it not okay another important part of context is uh, timing so a well-timed dollar is worth more than a poorly timed dollar Right. And here are some examples. Right. There's a giant and flea market, antique flea market in Brimfield, Massachusetts. That I think happens twice a year. It's like a hundred acres and tent after tent after tent of stuff. Right. And imagine that you collect cement garden gnomes. And you have like, you know, there's the, the preeminent dealer in cement garden gnomes is there. And on day one, you're going and you're checking it out, right? And you're circling and maybe there's like one extra rare one that the dealer has that you decide to buy because you know, you just spotted your, your, your big garden gnome collector competitor uh, on the other row and, and you know that he's gonna want this rare thing. So you go ahead and buy it. But there's like a bunch of other ones that you really kind of like. And day two goes and day three goes, right? And finally, it's at like five minutes before uh, the end of um, the Brimfield Antique Show, and it's time to load up the truck, right? And the dealer has, I don't know, let's say 200 cement garden gnomes left to load up back up into the truck, right? Believe me, your dollar is going to be able to buy a lot more cement gnome at 5 p.m. on the third day than at 8 a.m. on the first day, right? So the more your dollars are more valuable, the closer it's time to load the truck. That's what I mean about timing. The other way that timing can matter is what I would call a keystone dollar versus a run of the mill dollar. And a keystone dollar is the dollar that makes the thing possible, makes it stand up, right? So if you're a developer and, you're, and your, your, your bank loan clock is running out, like if you don't raise five million in capital, the bank is not gonna lend you that 50 million and you got like 48 hours to go before the bank pulls its, its promise to lend you this because you can't raise the five million, right? If you're the person who can contribute that last dollar 
for the developer to reach that 5 million to get the $50 million loan that's going to allow the skyscraper to go up. Well, 55 million won't get you much of a skyscraper these days, but you know what I mean, right? Your dollar is really valuable. It's priceless, right? Um, the other really, actually, this is a, a really great real, real in real life example that's a little more like relatable to than dollar than developers is um, if you go to buy a car at the end of the year or at the end when their their model year changes, and you go and and the dealer is this close to meeting an incentive from the automaker. Right. Usually they're given sales targets that they have to meet by for by quarter, by year. And if they sell one more car, they might get twenty thousand dollars. So you're there. You're like the last customer on the lot. You can get a very good deal on that car. The dealer might even sell it to you for eight hundred bucks, a thousand dollars less. Why? Because you buying that car is going to make them is make possible for the dealer to get twenty thousand dollars. Right. So there are a lot of times when we actually, when we matter in a transaction, that's a flex. Take advantage of it. All right. The other thing is your static versus dynamic dollar. And it's a little bit like the garden gnome, right? Except there, that was like, you know, Let's avoid breaking my back uh, was the motivation. Here, you can think of it as like Uber in New York City on New Year's Eve, way more expensive than on a Sunday at 3 p.m. Way more expensive at rush hour than at, you know, 1 a.m., right? So the dynamic pricing is you could say, well, that's that's the service provider selling that. But really, it's like if you think about it, it's like your how, how far is your dollar going? Your dollar is going to be worth more or less depending on the context in which it's being deployed. Right? And um, this is an important thing to remember. Warren Buffett will often say, you know, if shoes are on sale for, you know, 40% on sale, everybody's like thrilled. But when stocks are on sale, uh, you know, everyone's just like, you know, running is, is either really upset, running away or pissed off right, at their advisors. So the idea is that your dollar contextually can go a lot further, right? If you want that Uber, um, you know, at, at three in the afternoon on Sunday, you're going to get more mileage for the same dollars that you would uh, at, at midnight on New Year's Eve. And the same way that if you're buying stocks when the market is down, you're buying more stocks at a time. So that's why dollar cost averaging, this is like a little investment, <laughs> um, dollar cost averaging is so effective because it's hard for us to want to buy stocks or bonds when they are down. And that is, um, so when we have a dollar cost averaging, when we're putting a certain amount automatically over every period, whether it's a month, a week, a quarter, right? We don't have to make that decision every single time. So it reduces cognitive load. And we end up buying when the markets are down, which is when we should be buying. And it's really hard to time when, when the market's going to stop going down or then suddenly shoot up, right? So if you think of our, we tend to think of our money as very sort of static and absolute value. And if there's anything I'd love for you to take from this is this understanding that actually money is quite dynamic. And if you think about money as kind of the socially acceptable, tangible representation or electronic representation of, a, of an energy packet, right? Whether it's labor um, or rent on money, you know, interest being paid, um, that, that it, it wants like energy, energy wants to flow, right? So your money is always growing and shrinking. The value of it is growing or shrinking based on context, your purchasing power, as well, so um, and and there are times when when your when your money when your dollar goes further than another dollar, and so understanding that hierarchy uh, is helpful to figure that out as well. And so don't be afraid of dynamism and change. I guess is my point. So this one is a little um, interesting: <laughs> uh, the sadistic dollar versus the masochistic dollar. <laughs> And um, it's it's interesting because there's like there's two ways of looking at this, right? 
So one is if you are a jerk of a customer, right? If you are just a colossal pain in the neck, your vendors are going to charge you, if they're willing to work with you at all, that is, are going to charge you a premium because you're so high maintenance, right? Um, and so, but we don't always know that, right? All this are like super entitled people going through, through, through the world. But there can be a hidden premium if you're a sadistic dollar. Right? Um, the other thing is that I believe that there are ways to do business. And this is you as a consumer, or even if you don't have a business, you are interacting with business all the time. Right? There are ways of doing business. There are some ways that are more bono than others, right? So I found it really interesting that there's a consortium of really large companies that said, we need to do this differently. And when you, when, if you're a finance bro, you're going to be very focused, all, you know, very focused on, on your cash management cycle, right? So you make your customers pay you as fast as possible. And you stretch out the payment to your vendors. And so you get to enjoy this cash window where you got cash coming in fast from the people you can extract it from. And then you're really slow to pay. And they realize that small businesses, right, which tend to be often owned by women and people of color and just their emerging businesses, they're not like big Fortune 500 well capitalized businesses. Right? that they're ending up financing these large companies, right? Because they provide a service and then they wait 90 days before they get paid, right? So a lot of these large companies are actually have, have programs for small businesses, for the business, small businesses that do business with them to accelerate the payment to the small businesses as well. So you know that when like large corporate America is actually like doing this, that it probably is really, really bad, right? And so um, I would say that maximizing for the last nickel on the table is, is um, not good for the whole environment and all of your, your stakeholders as well. Um, and so I think it's important to look, and I, I can't tell you like which is worth, which is worth more the sadistic dollar or the masochistic dollar, but um, it was an interesting concept. But I would say if you're a jerk, your dollar is worth less to the vendor. And if you behave like a jerk as, a, a, uh, as an entity, um, your, your, your karmic dollars anyway are gonna be affected and probably your bottom line dollars too, unless there's such an asymmetry. And so I was really, really happy to see the large, this consortium of companies. Um, I think Meta was one of them, Facebook, um, to trying to, to, to redress that, that balance. Um, all right. So now, I'm just checking on time here. Um, let's talk about how these frameworks actually pay off in real life. Because you're like, all right, Mariko, you've got these crazy examples, you've got these conceptual hierarchies, but like, how the hell do I make this relevant to me? Fair question. So one, if you want to have guilt-free negotiations with better outcomes, this framework can be really, really helpful. And then if you also want to divide up property and assets when you part ways, very useful framework. Uh, when you want to think about how to price, how to deal with customers, very useful framework. So I'll give you three real life examples. Um, I was working with um, a group of myofascial therapists. It's this kind of specialty massage um, that's really, really wonderful, actually. And um, there was a, a therapist who said, what do I do? I have, you know, I offer a 10%. If you buy a package of 10, um, you know, 10 sessions, you get 10% off. So each session is 10% less. And I have this customer who said, but I, I want to pay the discounted rate, but I don't want to pay you all up front. I want to pay as I go, but I want to pay the discounted rate as I go. And, you know, being like a super nice conflict avoiding person, plus the customer is always right, you know, we're told all that stuff. Like in her bone, she knew that there was something really, really like messed up about this request, right? Ta-da, framework to the rescue. I said, wait a second, right? Here's the deal. The deal is you get the discount because you give me the money up front, time value of money, right? It's right. I'm willing to give you the discount because you 
are you are giving up the use of that money for the ten for the period of whatever ten sessions would be, and uh, I get to use that money, right? So it's a dollar today. It's worth more than a dollar tomorrow because of inflation. It's worth more because I get to, uh, it can put it to work. And it's good for me because I've kind of de-risked my business. I know I have a certain amount in the door and that's worth something to me. That's worth something to have some predictability and stability, right? So it's a it's a kind of variation of that recurring versus non-recurring. It's, it's a, I have the money up front and um, I'll deliver the services. And for the customer, the customer in exchange for giving up a chunk of money, right? The customer knows that they they they, they have a discount that's worth it, and uh, they know that the the therapist is going to is going to sort of guarantee them their spot over those ten sessions. So there's a lot of trust in that exchange, right? But it makes sense. This customer wanted the benefit, the ten percent discount, right? In exchange for what? Nothing. A vague promise that I'll be here every week, right? And so once she saw that, it became so much easier to be able to say to a customer like that, you know, hey, I'm giving you a 10% discount. Like what's, you know, what's in it for me? (laughs) I mean, nobody will ever really put it that way, but there has to be something in exchange for that, right? Because she's giving an economic concession. She should receive an economic benefit back. The other way they can be handled for those of you who are who are practitioners um, that where this kind of model would apply is you could use the coffee shop model, which is that you know what I'll tell you what I'll charge you the full per session price, and if you come for ten sessions, you'll get one session free. That's a ten percent discount, just like the coffee shop. But then this is kind of like the customer has in fact maintained his promise of I'll be here. So I, I have earned the discount, but you got to earn it first. You don't just get it without an, an economic exchange. Um, the second example that I wanted to share with you is um, I was looking over, uh, I was doing a website audit for another therapist, and I saw that the price for his six pack of se- six sessions, the price per session was the same as 12 sessions. And I said, hey, that's not super compelling because I know I'm going to be giving up more money up front, but I don't really get anything in benefit. It's kind of like the opposite of the first example that I gave you, right? So it's important to be thinking about um, uh, 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 when you have this framework, you, you can kind of sort out more easily that the emotional thing of, wait, I'm being asked something, I sense a boundary violation, but I don't quite know what it is. You just sit down and you just map out, follow the money, follow the money, and you'll know what's going on. The third example is a little more complicated, um, but it's really one that's worth sharing because it kind of, it uses all of these things wrapped up in one example. I had someone who came to me who bought, had she and her partner had bought a a perfume company from somebody. And um, they had, uh, they'd each put in the same amount of money. They had, uh, and the, the seller had sold it to them with a note so they 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 were gonna think of it as like debt. They would have to earn, you know, pay pay off the seller over five years. Her partner, after you know, I don't know, a couple of months, suddenly decides she doesn't want to do this anymore, right? And her she was the operating person. The partner was the marketing genius. Um, two months later, her partner says, "I want my money back. I want all of my money back, and I want it now." <laughs> okay. And my client was beside herself because it's, you know, it's a breakup. It's a business breakup. It's emotionally very hard. But financially, like she knew it was messed up. And again, when I say we all intuitively know that there's something wrong, but this framework helps us like actually map out what's wrong. And if I've done my job correctly, right, I think you all will be like, yeah, okay, so let's go through the list. She put in money, let's make 10,000. She put in $10,000 into something illiquid and she wants to get it out as though it's liquid. It's not liquid anymore. She took water, she turned it into ice, okay? Number one. Number two is she's 
by leaving, she's destroying half, she's destroying some of the value of the business. Why? She's the marketing genius. Now the business has to fall on one person's shoulders. And that person probably wouldn't have done it if she didn't have this partner, right? So she's damaged the business and she wants full price out. Third is they incur debt together. My client owes the seller money. So you've damaged the money, you've incurred debt, and now you're going to walk away from your obligation, from your debt obligation, right? When you look at it that way, you're like, no freaking way. No way. And it makes it so much easier, right? Um, but here's the thing. When somebody gets super hung up because the partner got really, really hung up on the number, really wanted that number back, um, and I say, well, she can get that money back, but she can get it on a on, by sharing some of the risk. She can get it if you generate enough to pay the seller another. You know, she can get it on a different time frame. But you cannot get your money out instantly when you've done all the things that you've done, right? And I think you can probably um, see that with me. Okay, um, we're getting close to time, and I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, Separating out the emotions, right, is a function of the emotions from, from, from the finances, and then reintegrate them and always think in terms of risk, time risk, credit risk, uh, liquidity risk, right? Am I going to be able to get it out without a, a, a transaction cost? Am I going to get it out quickly? Um, the other thing that's important in, in, in terms of being able to have happy money is um, I'll leave you with one concept, which ties into what I've talked about. Uh, which is, um, and I think Cody Sanchez, who, who, who writes a lot about, about businesses, um, has, which is my price, your terms. Your price, my terms. And what that means is the terms part is what I was talking about with context, right? And so if you really want $12,000 for that thing, right, I get to dictate how I'm going to pay you. Right. And if you're like, no, 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 I want all the money up front. Right. I want all the money in unmarked bills, whatever. Right. Then we're negotiating price because your terms, right? My price, my price, your terms. So if I say I'll give you $10,000 for that, you get to say, all right, you give it to me right now. Right. So when we're thinking, because we can get very fixated on the number, and just remember that number is dynamic, shrinking, expanding, contracting. That number changes based on its perceived value. And that number often changes just based on its objective value. Uh, and if we can sort out what's objective, what's subjective, and if we can sort out what's making us really want to like do this thing, do this thing, fear of motion, fear of missing out, fear of whatever, we're going to make bad money decisions when we're not grounded, when we're not uh, when we haven't mapped out what's going on money-wise, when we haven't figured out, gotten in touch with all our feelings and figured out what's going on. And you know the difference. You know when you feel, when you're in your body, when you're calm, when you're grounded, right? That's the place from which you want to make these money decisions. All right. I have a weekly email. You can find me in all the places. Um, and um, also the why is uh, I'm, one of the things that you might want to sign up for if you're a business owner is the accelerator program um, where we're kind of focused on developing financial intimacy with financials and um, in order to create some growth. And um, Marla uh, and her colleagues at the Y do amazing things. So um, these are all the things. And I know we're like just about out of time. I have time on the back end and I'm happy to ask to answer questions. I'm happy to ask questions too, but you may not want me to do that. How are we doing? Because now I can see all your faces again. So we do have a question. Okay. Um, from Jade, since the dollar is worth more today, would you take money out of deferred account, pay the taxes today, and invest it? All right. So, Jade, I would trust you to like give me a complicated, sophisticated question like that, being the complicated, sophisticated person that you are. All right. So that was always, you know, that was always the part where I'm like, all right, I know this question is going to come up. So the reason a tax, a tax deferred dollar 
when it can live in a tax deferred container and compound, remember how I said time is your friend with money, right? It's compounding in this safe tax deferred container, right? Then um, I let it continue. So then what you do is you do the calculation of if I cash it out now and pay taxes, Am I going to be paying at a lower tax rate now than I'll be paying at a low at a tax rate in the future? So a lot of these things are are you're always like betting on the future, and that's always not a sure thing, right? But a tax deferred, the reason that uh, all these tax deferred retirement things are sold, you know, I mean, they exist and they're valuable and they're sold is because you're not paying taxes on the appreciation. So you the compounding that 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 piece of taxes that you're not paying is is earning money for you. And that has a lot of value. Depending on when you should actually cash it out is a function of age, is a function of income, is a function of your asset mix, is a function of whether that tax deferred account can be passed on to your heirs in a tax efficient way, everything else. So it gets complicated really fast. But if you were to say to me, here's 20 bucks after tax or here's 20 bucks and you're going to have to pay taxes on it, of course, I'm going to go for the 20 bucks that, you know, I don't have to pay taxes on. Is that helpful? Okay, great. And we had another question from Jane. Uh, this is a very informative session. I had a question about growth and the reflection of return. Uh, okay, hang on. Jane, Jane do, you want, do you want to maybe tell me a bit more about specifically what your question is? Because I want to make sure I'm answering it because otherwise okay. I have a very vivid imagination. So. Hi, thank, thank you. I guess my question is, so, if you're constantly, like, there's a question I'm asking. We're in year 10 and mm -hmm. it's, it's a slow growth. You know, I guess at what point do you, ref, what, what we're at a, I'm always reflecting on the, you know, the return on, on our, on our investment of growth. Does that make sense? Right. So are you getting, when you invest a dollar to create more growth, are you getting the, the return on your invested capital, basically? Is that what you're asking? Um, I think, yeah, but like more so um, like business growth, right? Like uh -huh. fully getting larger and taking on more. Uh -huh. right? Like it's a constant, it's this constant circle, right? And, it, right. and I'm, I, I, my, my challenge is that I don't feel like I'm seeing the um, return on all of this investment, you know, the space, the size, um, I guess, how much time do you give it? I mean, we're on year 10 and every couple of years, there's a, there's a shift, there's a change. Uh -huh. um, so <laughs> my favorite answer, it depends. <laughs> I know you're gonna, told you you're going to hate me by the time this is done. <laughs> all right. So it really depends on, 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 on the nature of your business how how much you've been have you been you know are the partners getting enough money out of the business is the is the business being managed for cash or is it being managed for growth the other thing about growth is growth sucks up cash generally speaking and depending on what business you're in it can suck up a lot of cash that's why a lot of like startup companies tech companies are they they're they, they're fast growing and they're losing money but they find investors willing to finance them because they see the sort of, you know, the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel and the big prize. And so they're willing to fund that growth. So it really, like, I'd have to sit down with you and, and, and go, all right, what's the, what's the business, what's going on? And then there are ways to calculate whether you're getting enough of a return. So it could be that you could be getting a better return with exactly the growth that you have now. And it's a it's a it's an it's a it's an operations a management issue. Uh, it could be the nature of your business is a low return business, and maybe you want to optimize for you know what let's this thing can only grow at three percent. Let's not try to make it grow ten, and let's just try to get more money out more cash out of it. So there are a lot of you know there are a lot of business considerations to do that. But if you're feeling and there's no magic number in terms of years, right? Because I mean, some of these startups are unprofitable for years and biotech companies for years, right? But they have to have a funding source. <laughs> so what I do with people just starting out, this is not your case, but just starting out is, all right, what's your run rate? What's your burn rate, right? How much do you have to spend? How much money do you have? And then at what point do you say enough, right? 
um, back to the sunk cost thing, right? Where you're like, all right, I give up. There's no shame in giving up. It could be the best business decision and life decision too, right? Um, so, so I would say 10 years gives you 10 years worth of data, should be able to give you an answer to get you that clarity. Um, so I would say you, you, you have enough water under the bridge to, to find out. And it's a matter of finding out too. So now you've really got me curious. You're going to have to ping me and like, tell me what your business is and what's going on. With it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. We have a really odd business, so I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. But I mean, really, I love talking to people about their businesses. So, um, please do that. Um, okay. Anybody else? Uh, okay, I, I see subjective value. Per se. Okay, I can't do, I can't do, ch I can't multitask. I can't do chat and process at the same time. So, um, okay. I think that's no more questions, but a lot of thank yous. I appreciate folks got out what they, you know, some useful information and ways to think of that hierarchy of a dollar. Uh, you have ways to contact Mariko. I would highly recommend set, you know, signing up for her weekly newsletter because she sends out a nugget every week and it's you know all the beneficial for individuals managing their money or small businesses. And then um, definitely fill out our intake form. I'll send all these resources again through email as well as a link to this recording. So uh, have a great week. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. All right. Bye. Bye.